So here's another introduction. Hi, PSP team. My name is Rebecca Lane, and we are giving the delivery lecture right now. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, well, I want to ask you guys a question. So what do you think delivery has to do with public speaking? So today we have Jenny and Sam with us, and uh, they're, they're going to be answering most of our questions. Okay, so Sam makes a great point. He says delivery might refer to a great hook. Okay? What do you think, Jenny? Um, how people interpret what you say and the way you, the, like the manner that you speak it. I don't know. Awesome. Yeah, you guys are both making some really good points. So specifically, delivery today is more about how, how you say the words that you're saying. So later on in this month, we're going to talk about how to write a speech, how to write a great hook, and that's a huge part of making a good speech. But right now, this is really about those nonverbal cues and the verbal cues that you're giving people. Um, so some of, some of what we are going to talk about today, you could watch somebody on mute and you could observe the, the qualities that we're, we're going to talk about. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to give you some vocabulary words. And so Sam and Jill and you guys out there in the, um, in the archive video, take some notes, write down these delivery terms. So the first delivery term is non-fluency. So these are vocal tics that replace pauses in speech. So anytime I say, uh, er, um, you know, I'm thinking um, about what I want to say. Those kinds of things are non-fluencies. All right. We also have verbal fillers. So verbal fillers include uh, any words. So non-fluencies are the sounds that we make to fill in the gaps. Usually non-fluencies indicate that we're thinking, that we're unsure. There are a couple of different things. Um, verbal fillers are more, you know, like they're full words that also indicate that we're thinking. Sometimes they indicate that we're looking for a nonverbal response from the person that we're talking to, stuff like that. Okay, we are also going to talk about proxemics. Now, those of you in my class, you aren't going to use proxemics until your industry and persuasive speeches because those speeches will be delivered on your feet. But it's important to start to talk about now. Proxemics is um, how near or far you are from your audience and how you change that up throughout the course of your speech. We also have pronunciation. So this is how you say a word. So if we're going to go into like Webster's Dictionary or something like that, we would see, um, we would see pronunciation. Um, usually it's, uh, I'm using a lot of non-fluencies, uh, usually it pronunciation tells you what emphasis to put within the word. So what syllable gets the emphasis. Uh, whether it's a long A or a short A sound, stuff like that. Now we also have articulation. So articulation is not the same as pronunciation. Articulation is how crisp are the words that you are saying? How much emphasis are you putting on the consonants? So, and, and again, all of these terms, we have creative choice in the way that we use them. So, uh, like articulation, I can choose to articulate very clearly, and that is my choice. And perhaps, depending on the environment that I'm speaking in, this is the best choice. Or I can choose to, uh, to, to not articulate so much. And so sometimes when I articulate a little bit less, it makes a difference in how I sound. And so there are differences. There, there's, those were extremes. And there are a lot of variations that happen in between. And so sometimes when we're looking at articulation, sometimes you'll see speakers who put emphasis on T's, but they don't put emphasis on D's or uh, stuff like that. So every speaker is not the same in the, in the consistency of articulation. Stuff to think about. We also have projection. So projection is the act of actually getting your voice to the back of the room. Projection uh, means, if I'm projecting, it means that the person in the back can hear me. We also are going to talk about volume. So volume is 
how loud or soft. I think of volume as dynamics in music. So volume is, am I going to speak loudly and what is the effect that that has or am I going to speak softly? And what is the effect of the reduction in volume? And what happens when I have a contrast? What does that do to the way the audience listens? So this is the kind of conversation that we're going to have. Okay, we also have gestures. Now I get a lot of questions about gestures and, and this I'm going to ask you guys. And I think we're gonna watch some videos together in just a second. Um, and generally, the rule of thumb for effective gestures is do the gestures contribute to the meaning of the verbal message? So are we creating physical emphasis on something? Are we creating um, a movement that that goes along with the emotion that we want our audience to get? Or are we creating gestures that are distracting? So anytime a gesture is distracting, and usually gestures that we describe as nervous gestures, those are gestures that don't contribute to the meaning of the words that are being spoken or the emotion that is being conveyed. So whenever you're evaluating gestures, whenever you're trying to think about gestures you want to include, um, that's what you're looking for. Do the gestures add to the meaning? Okay, and we're also going to talk about continuous eye contact. So what is, and, and the question that I have just for, for the next activity is, what is the effect of eye contact? What is the effect of eye contact when I break it? How long can a speaker go away without losing your interest? So think about that. Uh, and, and that's something that you can think about even while you're watching me. So right now, I think the archive video, you guys won't be able to see the video. But those of you who are here, you can definitely watch me speak. And so there are times when I'm going to turn away and I'm going to, to look at the other screen. So pay attention and notice how your attention differs based on where I'm looking. How you feel included based on where I'm looking. So right now, I'm guessing you're feeling a little bit less included because I'm really not, I'm not looking at you at all. But now I'm looking at you. So how does that change your experience? Um, even when we're thinking about delivery, we're thinking about audience-centered speaking. And so a lot of this, we have basic nonverbals that human beings, especially in American culture, especially in American culture, it, it makes a difference. And so Sam made a really good point. Sam says it makes the message feel more personal when, when I was looking at you guys. So that's something to think about. All right, so the next thing that I wanna do is I'm gonna play some, some TED videos. And this is my first time trying to play videos over GoToMeeting, so there, um, this may be successful and it may not. It depends on the, on the speed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a very small clip of a video. And while I'm playing the small clip, what I want you guys to do is listen to their voice. Listen, or you know what, don't, don't even listen to their voice. This one, I want you to watch their nonverbals. So what is the speaker doing? Does it look like they're interested? They're interesting to watch? Does it look like they're not interesting? These are your questions. I had it all set up, but now it's not there. Yeah. As you so we're just going to watch, watch this clip. And as we're watching this clip, um, pay attention to the speaker's body language. So does he look welcoming? Does he not look welcoming? Does he look engaging? Does he not look engaging? Does um, he look like somebody that you trust? Does he look nervous? Does he look confident? What do you guys think? Oh, yeah, the video is playing. Can you see it? Oh, dear. That's a shame. Okay.
Can you see it now? How about now? Okay, so as you're watching the speaker, I'm going to ask those same questions. So does he look, does he look interesting? Does he not look interesting? Does he look nervous? Does he not look nervous? Does he look confident? Does he not look confident? Do you trust him? Do you not trust him? just based on the nonverbal. So you probably, you can't hear him right now. You shouldn't be able to hear. So what do you guys think, Jenny and Sam? Okay, Sam, you say, Sam says that he looks sincere. So why do you think he looks sincere? What nonverbals is he giving you? Okay, so Sam says that his facial expressions look passionate. Okay, cool. So what about the rest of his body? Okay, so Jenny says that he looks like, with his hands, it looks like he's talking about himself. And so what makes you think he's talking about himself, Jenny? Because he's pointing to himself a lot. Okay, so that's a really good point. Cool. There's something that I'm noticing. Do you notice that he's been swaying back and forth a lot? He's not really, he's not really planting. And so to me, that usually indicates that there's a little bit of nerves happening, that there's a little bit of, of nervous energy. Do you feel it? And do you notice the contrast? There's a contrast when he actually decides to stay still, right? Like right now, he feels different. Did you notice that pause? So there was a little bit of a pause and then he actually, he felt calmer. So what's the difference when a speaker feels nervous when you, when the nonverbals indicate that a speaker feels nervous versus the nonverbals indicating that a speaker feels calm? What does that do to me as an audience? What do you guys think, Sam and Jenny? Okay, so when a speaker starts, uh, finds that place of calm, Jenny says that that might indicate that what he is talking about feels important to him. I think that's a really good point. Sam, do you have any different observations? Okay, and Sam says, Sam makes another really good point. Sam says if the speaker feels nervous, it makes them seem like they are not not sure about selling their point. All right, and so this brings up a really good point. When we are talking about delivery, it's possible to have different reads on the same nonverbals, and that's completely okay. A lot of this stuff is open to interpretation. Um, so as a speaker, your goal is to compile a bunch of different nonverbals that, that tend to work together to create the effect that you're going for, to create the effect on your audience. And, and there is some research that, that supports that in general, certain nonverbals are, are um, translated, are, are read in certain ways. Um, so something to think about. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some different speakers and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna watch them without the volume. When you think about... Um, let me know if you can see it. Sam and Jenny, can you see this?
Okay, excellent. So for this video, we have two speakers. And so we've got two nonverbals to look at. And so what are these speakers communicating? Are they glad to be here? Are they comfortable? Is this conversational? Is it not conversational? Do they look like they are, um, do, they, do they look engaging? Do they look nervous? Okay, so Sam makes an awesome observation. Sam says they seem comfortable, they are feeding off of each other as well. So Sam, how do you know they're feeding off of each other? Jenny makes a good point. She says that, that we know that we're feed, they're feeding off of each other because they're looking at each other. So they're watching for each other and they seem to be waiting for each other is what Jenny says. Okay, so Sam says that they're speaking, uh, he thinks they're speaking conversationally because uh, he's watching their body language. So what's specifically about their body language, Sam? What makes it feel conversational? And to add on to that question, what makes it feel conversational? But so Sam is saying they turn to address each other. They reach out to one another when they speak. Awesome. Okay. So here's another to add on to that. Are they speaking? Do they look like they're being professional? Do they look like they're speaking to a professional audience? Or do they look like they're speaking to good friends? Jenny says both. Okay, why? Okay, so Sam says it sounds like a motivational speech of trying to sell a timeshare. Why do you say that, Sam? You're going to notice that my main question here is why. Almost always. Okay, so Jenny says that it seems professional. So what nonverbals communicate to us professional? So what are they doing with their, okay, so let's break this down. What are they doing with their posture? What are they doing with their proxemics? What are they doing with their eye contact? What are they doing with their gestures? So Jenny says, okay, so Sam says, they're smiling, they're making eye contact. Okay, so smiling and making eye contact. So what's the difference between smiling and making eye contact to a business partner and smiling and making eye contact to my friend? Okay, so Sam says a friend may be more genuine and less rehearsed. Okay, this is a really good point. So what we're going to, what we're going to work towards in this class, we are going to work towards conversational delivery. And when I talk about conversational delivery, it's really about finding that balance between um, Finding that balance between speaking to my friend and speaking to a business associate. Because here's what happens. When we, um, when we uh, often when we are trying to be professional, we clamp down. This is something that, that human beings do. So you sit up really straight and you tighten all of your muscles and then your voice, you, you lose the inflection in your voice and, and then we just try to be very serious. But by being serious, We've tightened all of our muscles, we stop using hand gestures, and we make everything very small. Um, this indicates a couple of things, but mostly that is what happens when, when people are being stiff. So your goal is to find a way to work in that feeling of speaking to a friend 
without going all the way to super casual. So it's a balance. So, oops. So today we're going to talk about dynamism. And so I think about dynamism as, as the speaker's tool belt. And we're going to talk about how to actually get there. So first, we're talking about breathing. So breathing, when you want to speak clearly, you want to speak from the diaphragm, you don't want to use your shoulders, and you want to expand your tank. Okay, so we're going to do an exercise really quick. What I'd like you to do in your homes right now is go ahead and sit up on the edge of your chair, take your hands, put them on your knees, sit up really, really straight, put your feet flat on the floor. Okay, so what I want you to do right now is take a deep breath and breathe only into your shoulders. So, and as you exhale, exhale as slowly as you possibly can, and I want you to count how many seconds it takes to do that. Okay, so on the count of three, inhale, and then exhale. Okay, so I got to 14 seconds. Now I want you to do this, this same exercise one more time, but I um, want you to inhale as much as you can, but inhale as far down as you can. So I would say inhale down into your feet. Uh, more literally, it's really inhaling at, like down into your chair, something like that. So take a deep breath in. Your belly is probably going to pooch out with this. Um, take a deep breath in, and we're going to exhale as slowly as possible. Same deal, and count how long it takes. So inhale. Okay, so I got to 20 something. I'm going to stop because I don't know that that's really interesting on, a, on an archive video. But um, let me know how far you guys got. What was the difference? Sam and Sam and Jenny, did you guys notice a difference? Okay, so Sam says that for him, the exhale was a whole lot shorter when he was using the, the shoulder breath. Okay, so here's what's going on. When you breathe, in, when you breathe into your shoulders, you're, you're only using half of your lungs. And you're also creating a lot of tension. When you breathe down into, into the chair, that's really breathing down into your diaphragm. So your diaphragm is a muscle that is directly below your lungs. And when you breathe down, it relaxes. And that muscle gives you a whole lot of breath control. So those of you who play a, a wind instrument, a musical instrument, you might, you might understand what I'm talking about right now. Or those of you who are singers, you're going to understand. Um, and your breath is a wind instrument. So when we're speaking, our vocal cords vibrate together as the air flows through them. And so it's basically, it's basically a reed instrument, right? So we've got your vocal cords are vibrating. They're making that noise. And as the air comes through. All right. So the more control over you have that you have over that air, the more control you're going to have over the sound that you make. And we're going to listen to we're going to listen to speakers vocalics voice voice in just a little bit. Um, but it's something that you're going to want to be aware of. Also, um, when we speak into our shoulders, or when we breathe into our shoulders, Notice that your neck starts to get a little bit tense. We start to see some of the muscles up here, right? What this does is this puts tension on your vocal cords. So those of you who might be speaking for a long time, this is going to make you more likely to lose your voice. The more tension that you have in your throat, the, um, the more pressure you're putting on those vocal cords and the more likely uh, you are to, to irritate them. And so when we lose our voice, that means that our vocal cords have been irritated, they've swollen, and they're not vibrating together quite as well. Okay, so moving forward, we want to think about projection. And so when we're thinking about projection, there are two things that work together to make this happen. First, we've got these resonance changes. You've got the mask. Okay, so I'm going to make a metaphor right now. Uh, does anybody out there know the difference between an electric guitar and an acoustic guitar? Really basic. 
So what happens if I play an electric guitar and it's not plugged in? What does it sound like? Okay, so Jenny says that it sounds dull, and Sam says that it doesn't sound very loud at all. It doesn't even sound the same as if it was plugged in. Okay, so what happens if I take an acoustic guitar and play the strings, but it's not plugged in? What do you guys think? What happens? I'm playing an acoustic guitar, but I haven't plugged it in. What's it sound like? Okay, so Sam says the open area in the guitar allows for reverberation and better transmission of sound. Absolutely, yes. So here's what's going on is our voices have, or our, our bodies have resonance chambers. And so one of our resonance chambers happens in our chest. Um, we've got this chest cavity. If you, if you put your hand on your chest, you'll notice that you feel some vibrations. All right. So your chest has a little bit to do with your projection. Also, um, make the sound N right now in, in your home or whatever. Go, and do you feel, hmm? And put your hand on your on your nose and go na 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 na. You're going to feel you're going to feel some of that vibration, and so these two cavities in our body allow the the sounds to expand, reverberate, and then bounce off and out into into our audience, into the air. And so, if we direct the sound into our our nasal cavities and our chest cavity, we're going to be able to make the sound that we're making travel farther without pushing a lot more. So something to think about with that. Okay. So projection also involves breath. So we take breath and resonance and we put these together to, to help our voice travel to the back of the space that we're going for. And so it, it really does involve using your diaphragm, directing your voice to those resonance chambers, and shooting it to the back of the room. Now, this is important even in the online environment. What you're going to find is that sometimes it's, it's important to, um, to, to make, to speak, I'm going to rephrase that. What you're going to find is that we can tell if you are speaking softly in your room. It makes a difference. So if I'm if I'm trying to speak softly, but maybe I get maybe I get closer to my mic so that um, so that you can hear me. Notice the quality of my voice has changed, um, and it doesn't feel the same as as though I was talking to a live audience, because I'm not I'm not projecting my voice. Now I might be closer to the microphone, so you're probably still able to hear me, but but the tone, the quality that I'm giving you is completely different. So, so Sam and Jenny, did you hear a difference with the way that voice was happening? What's the difference in quality? What's the difference in feeling as an audience member? Okay, Jenny says more personal. Which one was more personal? Okay, so Sam said, so I, I lowered, when I, was, when I was speaking in my soft voice, I was sitting far away first, and Sam said he couldn't hear me. And then, when I went up close, he said it made it uncomfortable. Okay, so Sam, why did it make it uncomfortable?
<laughs> I was in your face. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I also have the, uh, I also have the, um, the video camera on. I forgot about that. Sorry. Okay, but it is. I was in my face, and and to me, a lot of times with the the softer voice, what it feels like is that the person is telling me a secret. Um, but I'm not looking. I'm not looking right now in this class for for secret telling. What we're looking for is is these larger presentation, larger presentation skills. Okay, so we're gonna move on to eye contact. So earlier, I, I played with looking at the camera and not looking at the camera. And Sam, and Sam and Jenny, who were in the audience, they said that it made a difference when I was looking at the camera. They said They said that they felt more included and stuff like that. Okay, so here's the thing with eye contact. Um, with the recorded speeches, you want to practice looking at the camera 95% of the time. That other 5%, you can look at your notes. You can look at your, um, you can maybe glance at where your slides are, stuff like that. But ideally, you want to look at the camera, at our eyeballs, 95% of the time. Now, if you're in a real life speaking situation, this gets to be a little bit different, right? Because I'm not going to look at one person's eyeball the whole time. Um, you want to spread that out. So we call this continuous eye contact, but we also call this having even distribution. So those of you in my class, you are going to, um, for your last two speeches, your industry speech and your persuasive speech, you will be speaking to a live audience. So with that one, what you will want to do is you will want to evenly distribute your eye contact around the room. And you'll include the camera as one of the people that you'll be looking at. So I might look over here because my mom's sitting over there and I might look over there because my brother's sitting over there. And then I'm going to come back to the camera because that's how that works. And ideally, we want to spend an equal amount of time with every set of eyeballs in the audience because um, it makes a difference. Also, when you're looking at people, you want it to be uh, really looking. And so this is the levels of, of eye contact, right? I can look at you and not see you. And what that means usually is that I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not looking. But then I can look and I can really be reading somebody's face. And that makes a huge difference. We can tell when somebody's trying to read our face, when they're, when they're actually paying attention to us. All right? So eye contact 95% of the time. When you have a live audience, we're looking for even distribution. Okay. So... We also want to think about expression, speaking with our face, emote. So human beings, we're, we're empathetic creatures. And so one of the things that we do, one of the things that increases empathy, and we do this naturally, is if I'm making a facial expression and you're listening to me, you will probably mimic my facial expression without even realizing it. It's not going to be a conscious thing. So as a speaker, it's important to understand that the facial expressions you are making are important. They're important in how your audience connects with you. So what that means is you want to make sure that your facial expressions match the words that you're saying. Otherwise, some discomfort will come out. So for example, sometimes people talk about subjects that make them uncomfortable. I had a student talk about STDs once, um, and it was a really serious speech. The words that the student was saying were very serious. But the delivery the student was giving us was, was he was smiling and he was laughing and he was giving like death statistics, but he was smiling. And so that contrast of serious information and um, a smiling facial expression, they don't jive, right? So what that usually indicates is a little bit of insecurity or it indicates that I'm telling a joke. This is a satire or it indicates that you might be making fun of that subject matter. So understand that the facial expression you make needs to needs to add to or correspond with the emotions you want us to get. If a topic is serious, you probably should make sure that your face also feels serious to look at. All right, moving forward, we're going to talk about inflection. So inflection, this is when we change our pitch and emphasis, and that allows the speech to stay interesting. So here's, what's go here's what happens. When... Um, Human beings, our ears look for patterns, or our brains look for patterns. 
And the moment I recognize a pattern, or the moment my brain sees a pattern, my brain goes, oh, that's a pattern. I don't have to pay attention to that anymore. Okay, so the same thing happens when our brain hears a voice. When my brain hears a voice and it goes, oh, that's a pattern, I'm not listening anymore. I'm not paying attention because what's being said isn't as important, right? Okay, so we have things where um, we can change pitch and we can change emphasis. And that changes the way our audience hears us. So pitch refers to, am I going high? Am I going low? Am I living in high? Probably not. I mean, that'd be kind of weird if I was living in high and I was doing that all the time. But the interest, the change comes in the contrast. I'm also not living in low, I'm just living there. Because that, that turns into monotone, right? When I just use the same pitch the entire time. But if I stay in, if, if I find a medium, and then I can have high for, for emphasis, or I can go low, pay attention. You'll notice that, that those changes as, as places for popping up to or down to, that makes a difference. And the same thing happens with emphasis. So I can emphasize something. I can put vocal vocal uh, emphasis. And so vocal emphasis comes with uh, emphasis on, on the consonants, right? So vocal emphasis. And there's a little bit of more air behind it, a little more volume, a little more push. So I've emphasized. That's how you do that. Coming into articulation. We've talked about articulation already, um, and we know that it's important, a strong use of articulators. So our articulators are, we've got our lips, our tongue, our soft palate, and our hard palate, and our teeth, okay? So if we're gonna go b, d, g, or p, t, k, what's the difference? If I go b, d, g, p, t, k, Sam and, Sam and Jenny, b, d, g, p, t, k. What's the similarity? What's the difference? Okay, so Sam says the first set of sounds are a lot easier to hear. Sure. Absolutely. How come? Okay, Sam makes a good point. You were using your voice to emphasize the sound. They're more, they could be more clear. Sure. Okay, so here's what I'm doing. B. What articulators am I using when I say the, when I say a B sound? B. Absolutely, Jenny, I'm using my lips. B. Okay, so in the other set, I was saying the, the P sound. So the letter P. What articulators am I using when I say the letter P? P? Absolutely, lips again, Sam. Okay, so what this is, is this is a difference between vocalized consonants and non-vocalized con consonants. And it's really pretty cool, right? So if I add voice to um, the sound made when my lips push together, that makes a B sound, B. But if I take voice away, P, that takes our P sound. So that's pretty cool, right? So B, that's our lips together, G. What articulators am I using with the, with the G sound, G? Anytime we articulate, it's two body parts pushing together, G. Okay, so we've got our tongue involved, yeah, what else? Tongue and what? Okay, Sam, roof of mouth, but I'd like you to be a little more specific. So our mouth can be divided into a soft palate and a hard palate. So is it the soft palate or the hard palate? G. So the soft palate is the stuff right here that's really hard. And the soft palate is the part that goes up when you yawn.
I would argue that it's actually the soft palate because you've got that, that roof of your mouth coming down to meet with your tongue. G. Okay? And then we've got k. So the hard palate, actually, that helps us make the uh, the D sound, right? So D, T, D, T. So D and T, those are the same. Yeah, Sam, absolutely. The hard palate and the tongue, that makes the D and T sound. D, T. Okay, cool. So we spent a lot of time on that. Um, if you ever get, if you are ever wanting to sound a little bit more corporate, you'll want to work on your articulation. If somebody says you sound really casual or you sound unprofessional, one of the things you will want to add to your speech is articulation. And so one of the exercises that you can do is um, saying your, uh, exercising your articulator muscles. So your tongue's a muscle, your lips are muscles, your soft palate's a muscle. And so really it turns into repetition. So you can go ba, 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 ga, 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 da, 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 da. And it's that repetition that will help you find um, emphasis. It'll strengthen those muscles. Now, the way to get even better at this is once you've kind of started to practice these, and, and you do reps periodically throughout the day, right? Bring in some tongue twisters and really try to hit all of those consonants when you're saying those tongue twisters. So that's how you get create stronger articulation and more control over your articulation. Okay, moving forward. We've talked about this already. So your articulators, just so you know, it's your teeth, your tongue, your lips, your hard palate, your soft palate, and your throat. And so here's a diagram that really shows you what this looks like. And that's your soft palate. So we're dividing that, the roof of your mouth, into two segments. So a lot of these work together to create this overall concept of vocal variety. So vocal variety comes with inflection, it comes with articulation, it comes with rhythm, it comes with pacing, emphasis, and pauses. All right, so I'm going to play you two more video clips. And actually, they're the same video clips that we were looking at before. And I want you to tell me um, what you notice about their vocal variety, including these words, inflection, articulation, rhythm, emphasis, pauses and pacing. And so one, I want to make one more point about, about rhythm. So sometimes when we sound like we're reading, usually that is because the words that we're saying, it doesn't feel like we're actually responding to, to anybody. And so, or, or ourselves, right? So sometimes I'll say something right here and I don't have a face in front of me, but, but I'm clearly thinking. And so when I am clearly thinking, I sometimes I, I slow down. And then when I'm back on track, I kind of speed up a little bit. So I've gotten my, I've gotten my flow. And so sometimes I can, my flow tends to sound a little bit choppy sometimes, depending on how well I've rehearsed and how much I'm focusing on it. But it also, we've got a lot of variation there. So inflection deals with your pitch and your emphasis. Articulation deals with the emphasis that we are putting on our on our consonants and how much space there is between the words, how much separation between words. Rhythm is really a musical term, right? So how much, so what's the rhythm of the words? Sometimes we can create a rhythm and once we create a rhythm, we can break it. And what happens when we do that? Pacing, that's how fast or slow we're talking, right? So, and, and the speed of my speech changes the way you take me in as a as an audience member right so if i'm speaking really fast this is going to have a different effect than if i slow down slowing down makes a difference it also helps me create emphasis now i don't want to speak this slowly the entire time i'm speaking because that would get boring but that would create a pattern right Okay, so we also want to include pauses. And so pauses help us slow down. Pauses also help us take a breath. When I take a breath as a speaker, 
the audience is going to take a breath with me. And that's okay. Sometimes it feels good to take a breath. So allow us that. Okay, so these are the vocal variety qualities. And, and I'm going to add volume in there. Volume is a vocal variety quality, something that we can mix up, kind of like you mix up in music. So we're going to watch some videos, the same two little moments again. And it's just going to be for a little bit. And I want you to... Tell me what you think about the vocal quality. Oh, looks like we're going to have to reset this. And we're going to be done with this lecture pretty quick. We're almost done, I promise. Had to. It was, yeah. As so, can you guys can you guys see this? Hear this? Excellent. So, listen to the speaker's voice this time. So you can probably well imagine, I was a strange child. Um, because the thing is, I was I was constantly trying to extend my repertoire of noises to be the very maximum that it could be. I was constantly experimenting with these noises. And um, I'm still on that mission. I'm still trying to find every noise that I can possibly make. And uh, the thing is, I'm a bit older and wiser now, and I know that there's some noises I'll never be able to make because I'm hemmed in by my physical body. There's things it can't do. There's things that no one's voice can do. For example, no one can do two notes at the same time. You can do two-tone singing, which um, monks can do, which is like... Um, but that's cheating. And it hurts your throat. So, um... Okay, so we've watched enough of this clip to get an idea for this guy's vocal variety, right? So what, what are you guys noticing? And we're going to go back to those vocabulary words, right? So what are you noticing about inflection? Did this guy have, did he have a lot of inflection? Or a lot of variation? So let's break it down even further. Did he have a lot of variation in pitch? Okay. Um, let's talk about his articulation. What was his articulation like? What kind of emphasis was he putting on consonants? Okay, so, so some of his, uh, and articulation is something, it's interesting because we don't notice it unless it's missing, right? So his articulation was fine. There was plenty of space between his words. He was putting enough emphasis on those consonants that we were able to distinguish which words he was saying. Stuff like that. He wasn't over-articulating for that environment, so it didn't sound off. But he found a nice balance. Okay? Uh, what about rhythm? Did you guys notice pauses? Uh, did you notice that, was he using the same pace the entire time? Was he mixing it up? What was he doing? Did he speed up, slow down, any of these? Okay, Sam says his rhythm fluctuated throughout. Okay, cool. How did that work for you, Sam? Did that make him interesting to listen to or was it distracting? Okay, so Sam says that it kept his attention, cool. All right. How about his use of pauses? Did anybody notice? Oh, and Jenny agrees. Okay, cool. So you guys in the archive, you might agree too. You might find that those uh, mixing up the rhythm worked for him. Cool. Okay, so what about pauses? Did anybody see him using pauses? Oh, 
Okay, so what was the effect of, of pauses on you as an audience member? Because a lot of times we associate pauses with, um, at least as a speaker, like if I'm up speaking in front of a group, if I pause, my first fear is that it looks like I don't know what I'm talking about. But Jenny makes a really good point. She said that pause just made us wait for what he was going to say next. Yeah. So sometimes a pause is completely fine. It gives our brains a chance to a chance to catch up. Okay, so I want to do, I want to play you guys one more clip. So we're gonna go back to these ladies. And I just want you to this time we're listening to their vocal quality. This picture you see here is the Great Pacific Gyre. When you think about plastic pollution in the marine environment, we think about the Great Pacific Gyre, which is supposed to be a floating island of plastic waste. But that's no longer an accurate depiction of plastic pollution in the marine environment. Right now, the ocean is actually a soup of plastic debris, and there's nowhere you can go in the ocean where you wouldn't be able to find plastic particles. In a plastic-dependent society, cutting down production is a good goal, but it's not enough. And what about the waste that's already been produced? Okay, so I want to call your attention to something. In general, these women are speaking very professionally, right? And they've got some variation in there. They've, they've built in some pauses. Um, but compare their delivery right now to the delivery of the guy that we just watched. Which one felt more sincere? Which one felt more like you were actually being spoken to? This one feels more sincere to you. Awesome. How come? And Jenny felt like the guy was being more sincere. Okay. Same, same question. How come? And let's watch a little bit more of this so we can think about that. Plastics take hundreds to thousands of years to biodegrade. So we thought, you know what? Instead of waiting for that garbage to sit there and pile up, let's find a way to break them down with bacteria. So here's another question that might help you build on your answer to the why for that sincere. Which one feels memorized? Or do either of them feel memorized? So the girls seem like, uh, Sam says that the girls seem like they desperately want people to listen to them. Great. Why? What are they doing that makes you feel like that? Remember the tools that we're looking at, right? We're looking at eye contact. Well, and, and see, here, this is what happens, is I'm sharing a video with you, which means that we're including all the nonverbals in there too, right? But try to close your eyes and really just listen to their voice. And we're thinking about uh, inflection, pacing, pattern. Are they speeding up or slowing down? Okay, so Jenny says they're louder and they're very passionate in tone. Cool, all right. Yeah, they're definitely using inflection. They're definitely using eye contact and they're using projection. Right. And so, and this is where we get into that part where it's really hard to separate when we're watching a speaker, hard to separate the voice, what we're taking in that information from, from the delivery. Right. And so that's why we're talking about them together, but they're two separate things. So one of the things that I notice, and, and both of these speakers are really quite good. So, so this is not me saying that one is not good and one is, is less good. Um, I tend to feel like, like Beardy Man is much more conversational. That doesn't mean that I think his presentation is perfect. It doesn't mean that I think it's um, necessarily better than, than the two young scientists. 
but his use of variation and his use of pauses feels more conversational to me. I feel like I get to watch him think. And I also feel like I get to see him see people. So there's things you can't do. And these limitations on the human voice have always really annoyed me because beatbox is the best way of getting musical ideas. And sometimes that can come down to, that can come down to personal. Yeah, it seems a little bit more relaxed, Jenny. He's a little more relaxed. And so this is something that we want to look for as speakers. We want to find a way to feel, to look relaxed when we're speaking to people. Because that um, tension is what comes when we are uncomfortable. Tension is what happens when we clamp down. So you'll notice that when I take a breath, I've relaxed a little bit. If you took a breath with me, you probably feel a little bit more relaxed. As a speaker, a gift to your breathing, taking a breath is a gift to yourself. It's gonna help you relax a little bit. All right, so we've talked about vocal variety. We are almost done, I promise. You will want to include these in your speech and I will push you this month to include inflection, articulation, rhythm, pacing, emphasis, and pauses this month. Um, a note that I give often is breathe and smile. So if I'm saying breathe and smile, that probably means that you've started to get a little bit tense. Find ways to add that breath so that it really feels like you're being sincere and you're really talking to us. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about movement. Ideally, we're avoiding distracting mannerisms. And so what I'm talking about here is we want gestures that emphasize what we're saying. So if you remember Beardy Man, he was using his hand a lot, and then he was holding the microphone with one hand. Now, this personally kind of got to me. Because <clears throat> he was gesturing a lot with one hand, and he wasn't using the other hand. Yes, this was a consequence of the situation. But I feel like it closed him off. Did you notice that his hands were... were were clasped over his chest a lot of the time. If he just opened up his body language, he would have been a little bit more accessible. Now, the two women that we saw, they did have open body language. And so that's something that I respond to as an audience member. They seem a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more sincere. So like I said, those two speakers that I picked, they were not necessarily one better than the other. They were just different. Okay, so we want to avoid distracting mannerisms. So what happens when a movement becomes distracting is it's not connected to the words, it's more connected to your nerves, usually. So like, for example, if I, if you're watching a speaker and they're walking back and forth from one side of the stage to the other and they're just going back and forth, that's what we call pacing. And so pacing usually indicates that I'm nervous. Also, with pacing, we've created a pattern. And that pattern has nothing to do with the words that I'm saying, right? So one way to play with proxemics, and that's playing with proxemics, right? So one way to play with proxemics in a way that is effective and provides contrast is to add in planting. So when I say planting, planting is when I stand still with my hips directly over my feet and I'm not swaying and I'm actually just standing really tall and strong. And from there, I can still look at everybody that I'm speaking to but I found a moment of stillness. So we want to think about contrasting movement and stillness. I don't need to use hand gestures the entire time. I can put my hands down and that's okay. Now, other distracting mannerisms would be like wringing hands. Specifically in the, in the video world, uh, something distracting is, is, is swaying in your chair. I know that a lot of times people will do this. And and right now, for those of you who can't see the video, I'm, I'm swinging back and forth in my chair because I've got a chair that's on a swivel. And so I'm swiveling back and forth. This isn't connected to the words that I'm saying, but I'm moving back and forth. And it's easy to do that in a swivel chair. It feels good. But it takes away from the words that I'm saying. Because like I said, like we noticed in those videos, it's really hard to separate the words that we're hearing and the person that we're seeing. So remember that everything that you do and say adds together to communicate a complete message. The words you're saying are only half your message. So wringing hands, usually that indicates, um, that indicates discomfort. Putting hands in your pocket, that indicates discomfort. Playing with your hair. Playing with your hair is really distracting. 
because that draws attention to your face, but it doesn't have anything to do with the words that you're saying. It's just an extra movement. And what we do when we see movement, what we what you do when we see movement is we look at it and we go, what does that mean? Oh, I guess it doesn't mean anything. I don't know. And so Sam made a really good point. So right now, as I have been talking about playing with hair, I've changed the mannerisms that I'm doing. And so I haven't mentioned it. I've just changed them. And so I started to play with my hair. I started to mess it up. I started to scratch my face. And Sam entered a comment. He said, the nervous mannerisms make you seem more amateur. You're not as professional. That's a huge comment. That is a huge difference. The difference between professional and amateur. That's the difference between I'll pay you money and I won't pay you money. Keep that in mind. So this slide, this exhibit natural posture, many of these postures are natural postures. So we're talking about the bear hug. So this is um, when you with when you have your arms crossed in front of you, a flesh wound would be one hand, one arm down by your side, and one arm uh, holding on to the to the bicep area crossed across your body. The rocker, so anytime we're rocking, and a desk lean, so leaning on the desk. So it's easy to feel like leaning forward on the desk makes things a little more more uh, personal. It also limits the amount of body language you're able to communicate with. By, by leaning on the desk, I can't use my hand gestures anymore. I've also lost a little bit of mobility in my head. And on top of that, I kind of look a little slumped. So by leaning back and sitting up straight, I, I gain access to hand gestures. I gain access to posture because even when I'm standing, when I'm sitting here, I'm able to straighten and slump my spine if I want to. So my shoulders, all of this adds to my ability to be expressive. So the desk lean, while it feels casual, it gets a little bit too casual. The bear hug, anytime we cross our arms. When I cross my arms, this feels really comfortable. But it changes the way my audience perceives me. Do you guys notice a difference, Jenny and Sam? Right now I'm crossing my arms. What's the difference? So Sam says that I seem closed off. All right. So just something as simple as going from having my arms by my side or gesturing with my hands and keeping my core open. I've taken my hands and I've crossed them in front of me. Now, maybe I'm doing this because I'm tired. But Sam says I seem cloned off, closed off, and Jenny is saying that I, I don't seem as happy. And I haven't changed anything else that I'm doing. So something as simple as closing off our posture makes a huge difference in the way people read what we're doing. Okay. So we're going to move forward. The same thing with gestures that I'm saying with voice is you don't want to create a pattern. So what we're doing is we're making sure that we're finding variation and, and varying the way that we put these pieces together. So what we have is we have gestures, we have vocal variety, we have uh, proxemics, we have posture, we have eye contact, we have emphasis, we have articulation. These are the tools that we have as speakers. And the speakers who use these tools well together, those are the most dynamic speakers. And these are the tools we're going to work on this month. And at the end of the day, you really want to make sure that we've got energy. So as a speaker, it's my job to transfer my energy to you. If I am enthusiastic, you're going to be enthusiastic. And that's just how that works. We are empathetic creatures. Now, if I'm enthusiastic and it's over the top, well, then we've crossed a line, right? So all of this is about finding balance, finding what is conversational, and finding... Um, finding what works. So throughout this, throughout this month, um, Jeff and I will ask you to try things. We will ask you to play with proxemics. We will ask you, ask you to play with vocal variation. We'll ask you to find places to breathe, find places to smile, find places to use hand gestures, stuff like that. And take a risk. Take a risk and kind of play with these things. Even if something feels awkward, 
awkward is often the first step to, to mastering something. When I first develop, um, so sometimes I take guitar lessons, I feel so awkward. But the more I practice, the better I get. Okay, so Jenny has a really good point. She says, what if, what if, um, what about people who get nervous? All right, so when you are nervous, <clears throat> things that you can do, you can breathe and smile. Breath is something that relaxes us a lot. So if, if you are a person who gets very nervous, one thing that I would suggest is um, find places to breathe. Um, I also have a tense and relax exercise that I can walk you through um, that, that helps. Okay, Sam's a, Sam makes a really good point. How can you be an effective speaker without looking like you're reading off of a script? This is a huge point. Okay, so in this class, we will encourage you to make a speaker outline. So speaker outline as opposed to writing out your speech verbatim. This takes some practice. So um, Sam and Jenny and, and you guys out there, have any of you ever, do any of you have story jokes that you tell people? So not like a simple knock knock joke, but a, a joke that is kind of a story and there's a punchline at the end. Do any of you have a joke like that? <laughs> Jenny says no and Sam says, of course. All right. <laughs> I'm a terrible joke teller too, Jenny. Okay, so I've got one of my favorite jokes. It's it's a joke about a frog. So it's the big mouth frog. And so this is a visual joke. So uh, you guys uh, in the archive may not be able to see this. So it's, uh, you know, once upon a time, there's a big mouth frog. And the big mouth frog is hopping along, along, along the road and he comes across a cow and he says, hi. And the cow's got some babies with her. And he's like, hi, I'm the big mouth frog. What do you feed your babies? And his mouth is really big because he's a big mouth frog, right? And the cow looks at him and she's like, well, uh, I feed my babies milk. And the cow goes, okay. And he hops along the road and he comes across a bird. He's like, hi, I'm the big mouth frog. What do you feed your babies? And the bird goes, um, well, I feed my babies worms. And the frog goes, that is just wonderful. And he comes across an alligator. He hops along the road, talks to the alligator. He's like, hi, I'm the big mouth frog. Why do you feed your babies? And the frog go, and the alligator smiles. And she says, well, I feed my babies big mouth frogs. And the, and the big mouth frog goes, oh, that is so nice. And he says that with a very small mouth. Okay, so I tell this joke to make a point. I hope I made the point. I may not have. It's a funny joke, right? Cracks me up every time. I'm a dork. Okay, so the the reason I say this is I don't tell that joke the same way every time. I don't remember. I know that I read the joke somewhere, but I don't remember the exact phrasing. Um, you watch me think about the words that are going to happen next. But at the end of the joke, it's there's a punchline. And I hit the punchline, you know, right-ish. And I, I think that, that many people, many of you will have jokes that that are like that. Or, or if you're thinking about stories, like stories that you tell people. So uh, sometimes I tell a story about, about how I listened to my dad's music when I was a kid. And so it was really cool because I remember listening to music that my dad listened to as a kid, but there's like this really specific thing that used to happen. It's like, I would be like six years old and at 6.30 in the morning, I'd pad down on my bare feet and I'd go and I'd watch TV, Saturday morning cartoons. And the way that I knew that my dad was up is I would, um, I would hear Billy Joel, the Innocent Man album coming out of the, coming out of his office. And the moment I heard that, it would be like eight o'clock in the morning, usually kind of around that time. I could smell his coffee and I'd pad into his office and I'd get my My Little Ponies and I would sit there on the floor and I would Pele with my My Little Ponies while my dad was listening to um, Billy Joel's Innocent Man. And that's like the most distinct memory I have of my dad and his music. Okay, so I might use that story to support a point in my speech but I'm not reading that story. This is a story that I've told over and over. I use different words every time, but it's a story that I've practiced. So what we are looking for from you guys as speakers is not a story, uh, a, an entire speech that's been written out verbatim. 
we are looking for you to tell us stories. And we, the thing that makes it conversational is that moment where you are looking for the right words. But um, as you'll notice, when I was telling the story about my listening to my dad's music, um, I know the story pretty well. I'm not looking for the right words in that I forgot the story and I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying. I'm looking for the right words in that um, I want to make sure I say the right word as opposed to a word that's less specific. Let's, let's make it a good story. Does that make sense? Jenny and Sam, did I, did I clarify that at all? Awesome. Okay. So every speech that you give, you're speaking from an outline. You're telling us, and, and, and that's going to come down to facts too. So a way to practice this, a way to practice all of your speeches, what I recommend is break down your main points. So you're going to have main points and you're going to have sub points within those main points. And every sub point is a story. So if I'm going to give you research, um, I'm not going to tell you the statistic the same way every time. If I'm going to cite that statistic, I'm not going to cite it the same way every time. So sometimes I talk about The Daily Show. And so the way that I might talk about that is, hey, so I was watching The Daily Show on Thursday night, and I, I was listening to an interview with Jon Stewart and Joss Whedon. And there was a moment, absolutely, Sam, thank you so much. Sam says, not exactly a script, but more like bullet points to touch on. Yes. And with that, I think we're done. So those of you who are going to respond to questions, actually, everybody in my class will be responding to questions for the archive. Um, and those of you who are not, those of you who are in Jeff's classes, you will definitely need to respond to these questions. So question number one, what are the six components of vocal variety? Question number two, what are your articulators? And we covered that on a slide, right? Question number three, what, um, what is the rule of thumb for continuous eye contact? I gave you guys a statistic earlier on. So what's the rule of thumb for how long you want to look at people as opposed to how long you want to look at your notes? What percentage of your speech are you looking at eyeballs? Um, and question number four, what is the difference between a nervous gesture and an effective gesture? So those are four questions. Can you guys, uh, Sam and Sam and uh, Jenny, can you guys repeat those questions in the chat box for me? I missed number one. Oh, I did too. Okay. Jenny, did you catch question number one? I should have written these down. Oh, I think it had something to do with vocal variety, right? So what are what are the six components of vocal variety? Question number two. What are the six? Uh, what are what are your articulators? And so specifically. What articulators do you have access to? So one of them, I'll give you a, it's a gimme, your tongue. Your tongue is an articulator. So what are the other ones? What are the six articulators? Question number three, what is the rule of thumb for eye contact? And question number four, what is the difference between a nervous mannerism and an effective gesture? All right. Great. Sam and Jenny, it was a pleasure having you join us. Thank you so much. 
Uh, is there anything? I'm going to stop the archive now. Uh, so those of you who are watching the archive, those are the four questions that you need to answer for Jeff. And um, those of you who are here, they are going to get to ask questions. So it was a pleasure. One moment. All right, archive folks, I look forward to having you in the next GoTo meeting. Um, have a fabulous Wednesday.